world. The Bronze Star Lodge of the Sun. But the, the subjective world of, a, of, a, of one rather powerful person can infringe on the world of another person. Mm. I mean, this, 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 uh, this is something that I began to see uh, uh, ramifications of politically and um, psychologically. Hello, dickheads! Like a pink laser beam of truth beaming straight from San Diego to your brain hole. We are your Venus babies stuck in the <laughs> refuge. Uh, oh, I wish. Yeah. Anyways, uh, today's episode is the world Jones made. Yay! <laughs> um, this is PKD's second novel. Um, second published novel. Second published novel, yeah. He had written probably six or seven at this point. But um, this was the second one to come out. So we're going to talk about that in a minute. Now, some of our segments that we have today. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. The dick news. There is no new dick news. So not that I could Cause, tell Because he's dead. Because he's dead. <laughs> yeah. Um, but just I felt that I needed to remind you the, again. The Kotaku magazine or whatever it was? Uh, Otaku? Yeah, whatever it is. Yeah, well, there is, yeah, that's true. There is a new issue of Otaku, which is a online fanzine for Philip K. Dick fans. If you go to philipkdickfans.com, that is a, yeah, you're right, that is a piece of news. And this is a really great kind of academic journal about Philip K. Dick, and they compile all the old reviews and uh, old interviews and new, and whenever there's a new article or an academic paper about Philip K. Dick, they compile them. They're really great. I've contacted the editor. I'm hoping that we'll uh, get him on an episode of Dickheads in the future. Awesome. So, yeah, um, Larry, you've read a little bit of it, too. I, I, I've been skimming through all the issues looking for Jones. Um, I found a couple of the reviews from the time that Jones got released through, through that zine, so um, I really appreciate it. So next, we're going to talk about uh, Philip K. Dick-related uh, media, like stuff that is Philip K. Dick-like. Dick-like suggestions. So I'll start off with, I watched a 2002 movie called Cypher. It was directed by um, Vincenzo Natale, who was the director of Cube and Splice. Oh, I like both those movies, actually. Yeah. So I he do love Cube. I haven't seen Splice. Yeah, so Cypher is... A um, movie, the first movie made after Cube, and it got, it was lost in the shuffle when Miramax was sold. And so um, Cypher and Equilibrium were two science fiction movies that Miramax just dumped into 10 theaters and got lost. So this movie was lost, but the reason why I decided to watch it is I was listening to an interview he did with Mick Garris on the Postmortem podcast, Mm -hmm. and he said that he considered Cypher to be a lost Philip K. Dick story. Oh, great. And now you've made it so I have to go watch it. <laughs> yeah. Um, I liked it. So the good news is is that um, it's, I mean, it, the low budget shows at times, but it has Lucy Liu and Jeremy Northram, I think are the actors that are in it. And the performances are really good. It is very Philip K. Dick. If you had told me, that Philip K. Dick had written the short story that this was based on, I would have totally bought it. Um, it's a paranoid film about a guy who gets hired to record corporate lectures. He's traveling around the country recording corporate lectures, and there is something... Not afraid. a good start to a pitch. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> well, he's going around recording corporate lectures, but there is a... He's being recruited as a spy for corporations and then there is a very philip k dick style taking over of his mind oh that sounds cool and at the end he and his his wife go off to live on a different colony colony? no actually so he (laughs) clearly did not actually write it (laughs) but it's very philip k dick influenced and it's not perfect but it's only an hour and 35 minutes so check out cypher from 2002 Sweet. Mind. Anybody else have a dick-like suggestion? Um, I saw Deadpool 2. That has a time-traveling assassin in it. 
That's pretty Philip K. Dick like. Everything else though, not so much. Not so much. Um if I were to say if I wanted to make a PKD inspired recommendation, I watched Mute months ago and I think that definitely has oh, some Oh yeah. Yeah. If nothing else, the the world they live in and the technology and how prominent it is in their everyday lives, I I, I would say Mute. Yeah, Mute is a great movie. Um Duncan Jones, the director of Moon, which is a very Philip K. Dick influenced mm-hmm movie directed mute and it's a movie he's wanted to make since before moon and it's probably the best i've seen paul rudd yeah ever he's He's awesome in it. he's amazing in it Uh, i know a lot of people didn't like mute but i liked it you liked it Uh, larry did you see mute or i have not seen it yet okay yeah it's a really cool movie and um duncan jones said that it's that the biggest influence everyone kept comparing it to blade runner but he said the biggest influence was mash the movie, not the TV show, right. but the movie MASH, which is really interesting because I didn't catch that until I heard an interview with him afterwards, and I, I saw it then, and uh, I definitely need to rewatch that one. I think, yeah. Yeah. yeah but mute. even even with the kind of the military presence in Mute is very PKD as well. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I would definitely rec- I I will second uh, Mute. Larry, uh, you got anything for me today, Papa Bear? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, something a little different. The... Um... There's a YouTube channel called Extra Credits. And while they normally focus on video games and various topics that they get uh, they get assigned or commissioned to do, they are currently doing a series on science fiction, the history of science fiction, uh, some of the great writers and the great moments in science fiction, and how it came to be what we know today. Mm. What's it called again? It's called Extra Credits, and yep. it's that's their channel. I'll check it and out. And the show itself is called Extra Sci-Fi. Yeah, yeah, I'm definitely going to check that out. Uh, so that's three really good dick-like suggestions. And, yeah, I, I really definitely want to back Mute again. I had forgotten about that one. So, yeah. All right, so the next segment is The World Jones Made was released in the year 1956. David. What was happening in the year 1956? Well, it's funny that you should ask. Oh, so my God. <laughs> let's get a context for the world that this novel was released in, because I think it's really important, and that's why we're always going to review this, is to think about, because we're reading this in 2018, right? Or you're listening to this whenever, because there's no time stamp on when you listen to Dickheads. Sometime in the future. Sometime in the future. So... When Philip K. Dick wrote this book was the same year that Elvis Presley had his first hit, Heartbreak Hotel. Uh, The biggest movie was Ten Commandments, uh, starring Charlton Heston, and it's the same year that the Cuban Revolution happened. So kind of put that in context of how, how far back this book goes. So if you think about a lot of the themes and issues that are in the book, you always have to kind of put in context, like, Holy shit, he wrote this the same year Heartbreak Hotel was a number one hit. Uh, the very first Elvis Presley song. So that's the context that I would put this um, this in. Nice. So, The World Jones Made. Oh, are you doing the math? Yeah, I was just trying to see how how long, how, how many years have passed since this book came out, and I'm bad at math. Um, yeah, I'm not going to be able to do that off the top of my head. But, well, that's um, 44 plus 18. Huh? Right? 44 plus 18, so that would be... 72? 62 62 years. So this book is 62 years old. Yeah, wow, I didn't even thought of that. Yeah. So, I mean, the the thing is, this book is not perfect. You're going to find out that none of us, like, like, totally love this book. Oh, (laughs) man, this book... (sighs) The, The... Should should we do the um, synopsis first so everybody gets yeah. on the same page? Yeah, but let's so, let's just. But I just wanted to make the point that this book is sixty two years old, so some of the themes and the ideas are very much out of date. But you, if you're going to go into reading all of Philip K. Dick's books, you're going to have to acknowledge that you're going to get a little out of date sci fi. A little. 
very much out of date sci-fi. <laughs> and that's fine as long as you realize you're going to get it. And some ages better than others. Like the man in the high castle ages really well. We're not there yet. I know. Uh, Scanner Darkly ages really well, but uh, uh, we got a while before we get there too. But the world Jones made did not age super well. No. So. So, David, go ahead and read your synopsis first. So, we have two different editions of the book. I have the edition that Mariner put out. And, okay. David, what do you have? I have the vintage books edition that came from 1993. Okay. So, here's the thing. The, the, what we want, the reason why we want to read these is because it's amazing to us how different the book sounds uh, from one description to the other. So, this is the vintage edition. Floyd Jones is a sullen, ungainly, and quite possibly mad, but in a short time he will rise from telling fortunes at a mutant carnival to convulsing, to convulsing an entire planet. For although Jones has the power to see the future, a power that makes him, makes his life a torment, his real gift lies elsewhere, in his ability to make people dream again, in a world where dreaming has been made illegal even when the dream is indistinguishable from a nightmare. Now keep in mind... All right, good, you read yours. <laughs> Precognition. A world ruled by relativism. Giant alien jellyfish. The Whoa. world Jones made is a classic Philip K. Dick <laughs> mashup, taking deep philosophical musings and infusing them with wild action. Floyd Jones has always been able to see exactly one year into his future, a gift in curse that began one year before he was even born. As a fortune teller at a post-apocalyptic carnival, Jones is a powerful force and may be able to free society from its paralyzing relativism if, that is, he can avoid the radioactively unstable government hitman on his tail. <sighs> you guys, I read this synopsis before I bought the book and I was like, fuck yeah, that is the book, I'm down, that is my jam. And then I read the book and I went, huh? Yeah, so it yeah. sounds great. It sounds great. There's some things, too, though, I got a question. Like, he's able to see his future exactly one year into his future before he was even a fetus. <laughs> well, but yes. don't you remember there's that whole chapter where it's discussing how he remembers being in the womb? Yeah, but how, was he in the womb for an entire year? No, I, I, I think he was... was he, I think pregnancy? I think the idea is that he can remember b the before. Or, or he... Right. It, yeah, but it, it says that he sees a year into the future. Okay, yeah. I, I'm just... okay. Well, look, I it also know. says that there's a radioactively unstable government hitman who, oh, I don't know, is there for three pages, and then they fucking cut his head off? Well, and look, my the the version, the vintage version, doesn't even ex doesn't even have anything besides the Floyd Jones and then you aspect, and right. there's like two other entire plots in the world Jones. Well, there's there's also a handful of other characters that get more time in the narrative Jones. than Jones, the Hitman, yeah, right, and the jellyfish, in the <laughs> in the. <laughs> Is there a jellyfish? Well, I think that's what they... I think it's referencing the drifters. Yeah. Oh, yeah, the but they're jellyfish. not jellyfish. They're pollen. Oh, yeah. great, David. I, well, I'm just saying <laughs> that, that they're... No, we assume everyone has read this. Yeah, yeah, we assume... Okay, well, if you... Well, if, if you're going to get mad about the pollen spoiler, then everyone's really mad about the Hitman spoiler I just dropped. <laughs> yeah, right. Right. Well, and it says it's fu infusing them with wild action. There, oh man, there There's is no action. In the, this book. The, the the most wild action is towards the end when he's when Jones is a, the assassination attempt happens. After that, it's it's just a slow plod towards shooting off to a different colony. Okay. So let's. So we've discussed what the plot kind of is. Um, so the basic idea of this book was that Philip K. Dick wanted to do several different story threads and weave them together. Now, one thing I know from doing our Solar Lottery episode is that the world Jones made was a bit of a reaction to, as the Solar Lottery was making the rounds before it was even published with different editors and publishers, is that they kept referring to Solar Lottery as being kind of a, um, uh, I think it was either a right-wing or left-wing book. I mean, he, was, he was reacting to the politics of it. And... So what he wanted to do with the world Jones made was take these different threads and these uh, storylines and and bring them all together into one novel. And he even said that he did not think that it was uh, a successful successful combination. Right. Um, which I'll in a little bit I'll give you the quote um, that he spoke about it. But 
one of the ideas with Floyd Jones and the idea of the Jones character was that he is a kind of stand-in for Hitler. and Not there, kind of. He's actively compared to Hitler. Yeah, he's, <laughs> yeah, that's true. I shouldn't say that, kind of. Yeah, he is actively compared to Hitler in every way, shape, and form in the book. This was supposed to be an idea of exploring the concept of whether if if Hitler, he kind of, PKD kind of suggests the idea that Hitler was some kind of precog and what was, what would it be like if he was a precog? And so we, I had this quote from Philip K. Dick where he said, a sort of transformation situation was happening in Germany after World War I. A liberal government, democratic in nature, is in power. It fights against absolutist extremist elements growing from within. It tries to use military and police power against them and fails. Jones, as a person, is based on what I've read about Adolf Hitler. The drifters, those are, um, for, I'm gonna pull out of the quote for a second. The drifters are, um, alien creatures in the, that are made of pollen, basically. They're, no, they're, well, they're made of goo. Yeah. And un, unspecified goo. Yeah. So back they're to. Incomplete cell structure. Right. Uh, and they use single celled organisms. And they come to planets and use planets to incubate and then and create, reproduce, and then move on after they've kind of swallowed life on the planet. And so uh, PKD goes on to say the drifters, of course, are the Jews. <laughs> Damon Knight, I believe, noticed this, meaning that's the drifters are supposed to be an analogy for how Hitler saw the Jews. You guys, I totally did not read this book correctly. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, so uh, PKD goes on to say, I tried to catch what I imagined was the zeitgeist of Weimar and translate into sci-fi terms. God knows what the mutants would be. Here the analogy breaks down. He doesn't even know what the mutants are compared to the storyline. Yeah, right. <laughs> so the mutants that he's talking about, for those of you who may be listening to this without having read the book, is that there's a storyline that launches in the book that one of the third kind of storylines is these post-nuclear mutant eugenics experiments, humans that are being rebred to colonize Venus. And well, so, uh, they're not are they are they rebred? I, I thought that Dr. Rafferty was just creating yeah, well, them. Well, they are they're Rafferty Rafferty's they're, actual kids. Yeah. Yeah, they're his kids. He's they're breeding kids. them. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. He's breeding them through eugenics to be Venusian And this colonists. is where we get our really good wackadoo pseudoscience. Oh, yeah. Because so, they're living in the... And <laughs> the very first chapter of the book is, is with yeah. the mutant Venetian babies. And they're living in what is called the refuge, which is like this glass case... Yeah. Where the 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 heat of Venus is recreated. Yeah, they they've basically replicated the terrain of Venus as best they can to try to what essentially see if we can. We because Rafferty says later in the book, I'm just trying to cut out all of the Very. all of all the variables yeah. and get straight to the point so we could go colonize Venus at some point. Right, which. <laughs> Is not a place you want to colonize, but whatever. Um, so yeah, but even Dick is saying here that God knows what this has to do with Jones. It doesn't have anything to do with Jones. So it's like he just took another story thread, and I mean, it does kind of weave in towards the end a little bit. What does it have to do with Jones, other than the fact that Cusick shows up? Well, it doesn't have to do with Jones specifically. Uh, no. Well, uh, other than Jones' revolt creates the impetus for them to fly prematurely to venus sure right. that's it man that's a lot of time and effort for just that well right. that's not where they're you know that's not not the end of their story that's just where their story and jones diverge well look and here's the thing um this book it's very easy to kind of if, if you're not enjoying the world jones made it would be very easy to miss a lot of elements that are going on in this book. And I admit, and I said this to Larry before we started recording, is that um, I certainly gained appreciation for this book the more I read about, of it. I didn't enjoy it as much when I was reading it. But I once I kind of read about like what PKD was doing, um, I found it to be more interesting. I would agree with that. The more I'm learning from you right now, the more interesting it becomes. Because I don't think I really 
thought too much about the comparisons to Hitler. No, well, I, didn't, I didn't. I didn't think of it as specifically Hitler, even though it's obvious now when you when you look at the actual comparison. To you Hitler. didn't think about it when there's a line where he actually says Hitler well, was I, a precog I in got, the book. I got the comparison well, there. I mean, I got the oh, comparison but still, there, but but I, was I never still viewing saw it as a as a just a godhead figure. Yeah, how am I? I don't know if even though he kind of compares him to Hitler, I never felt throughout the rest of the book that he kind of made Jones a villain. I never yeah. once felt that Jones was as villainous as Hitler. Well, that's because the Jews in this are single-celled organisms that <laughs> splat on the ground and die. Right. Which I mean, is, a very, is a very one, bad analogy. One is set on fire, which and, is and look, shitty. <laughs> That is a shitty thing to do. One of the things that really dates this book as being 62 years ago is just the fact that the Jews are this... The analogous Jews in the story are um, pollen, weird creatures that... Single-celled well, organisms with no agency. Yes. Right. Yeah. Yeah, and, and obviously, I don't think PKD was saying that he thought Jews were like that. He was trying to come up with an analogy for how... Hitler would have viewed Jews, but and, but is, but is Jones really that anti drifter? No, Jones is simply using them as a a a, a, a connecting connective uh, tissue. A connective tissue. Well, no, he's using a, them as an as argument, a uniting for, factor to get people behind him. Yeah, and and that's kind of what he's trying to make a point about with with Hitler. And it's funny because it's weird that PKD felt like. I really need to make a point about why Hitler's bad. Yeah. <laughs> <You know? laughs> right. uh, but then again, it was 62 years ago. But I would think even then there would be less of a reason when people had just defeated Hitler. Right, it was fresh in their minds. They like were 10 sure. years earlier. Like, right. when he's like, you know what I really need to do? I need to convince people Hitler is bad. <laughs> you know, like why? But I, isn't he also, in, if, if we carry this out, if we carry out this... Uh, this Hitler analogy, isn't he also being sort of sympathetic to the Hitler character by making Jones unable to control his own actions? Uh, have, Ooh, good point, Larry. Yeah, yeah, it is weird because he definitely does make Jones sympathetic in the sense of... Well, like, yeah, and that's the thing. You can't, you, you, you can't on one page... Issue. Sorry, David, I didn't mean to talk over you. No, go ahead. You can't on one page say he's just like Hitler and then all of a sudden try to make me feel sad for this broken man who's kind of a slave to his ability. Right. And that's why I I just never could figure out what stance PKD was truly taking on Jones. Yeah, and there's lots of weird wackadoo science in the if you if you look at Jones, okay, so the idea is that Jones can see one year into the future, right? And so if if Jones is and there's even like a suggestion at one point that one of the characters says, if we locked him in a room, then all he would see for a year, all he would see for a year is that room, and that's the only way to get around his ability to see in the future. Right. But, and which was an interesting concept, so, you know, but I don't think Jones can get out, he's locked in, he has to say the things that he said, that he says in the future. The things have to happen, he cannot get away from it, and that's supposed to be, like, kind of the tragic thing of of Jones as a precog. That's a character trait or, or an idea meets character trait that I think is separate from uh so, but, the idea of Jones but, as Hitler. But you can't you can't force an analogy onto us and then and then tell and not tell us when that analogy ends. True. You True. Know? Right. Otherwise we have to carry it all the way through. Which it doesn't. If, if the character is not representative of the same thing consistently we should know one way or the other. <laughs> right. You know, it's it's funny because, you know, there, there, there's a scene where they were, uh, it's page 19 of the vintage edition, where they talk about where Cusick, who's, who's really the main character of the story. I would say Cusick. Cusick? I, I say Cusick. Cusick? Yeah. Okay. Maybe it's because I'm thinking of John Cusack. Which, it shouldn't have Which been. is why I made it Cusick. Now I'm in, now I can only see John Cusack in the role. <laughs> but there's a scene on page 19 where he he like straight up asks him like why no personal fortunes like why why hasn't he had that and that th there's there's a whole kind of like that's where they kind of like set the rules of Jones and his 
And it says like, he has a sign that uh, on his tent at the circus where he's telling fortunes that, you know, no personal fortunes, just the future of mankind. And that kind of sets up the idea that he's, Jones is selling himself as, you know, I can tell you the future of our species and where we need to go. And that's how he kind of becomes this charismatic leader. And, but right. we are told that he had a bad experience with using that power for personal gain. Right. Because right. his story with the, uh, I, I can't remember the name of the character, but the, uh, the traveling salesman ends poorly where he ends up sending the traveling salesman, his partner, to jail. And the right. whole thing breaks up and he ends up, you know. Because he snitches person. on him in the cat house. Right. Prick. Yeah. So, uh, so I guess that, in a sense, that was Dick saying he tried to fight his his predestiny but was unable to. I think that's what, what he was trying to say there. Right. And then that's one of the more interesting scenes in the book is that flashback where he's yeah. in the car with the salesman. Mm-hmm. Okay, you know what I realized we totally forgot to do was talk about the actual publication of the book. <laughs> and so this was written in 1954, right after Solar Lottery. Whoa, David, I got whiplash from how quickly we just switched gears. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, but I, I do think this, this relates to what we were talking about. The original title of the book was Womb for Another. I like it. Yeah. Better than World Jones made? Maybe it's no, weirder. No, not at all. You think you think World? Okay, so I think World Jones made is a better title, but I totally like Womb for Another. <laughs> okay, it's goofy. It sounds like a pun. Um, it it is. is. Is it supposed to be a pun? I don't know, but it is. Okay, so the story. Well, it was purchased by Ace Books in 1955, and it was part of an Ace double with Margaret Sinclair's Agent of the Unknown. And that book is about a man who falls in love with a living pocket-sized doll. <laughs> okay, I All know right, nothing. Lars and the real doll. Yeah, I don't know anything else about it. But one thing that I, I, I there's this quote from Dick that I wanted to uh, about the writing of the book that, and this is I just was looking at my notes. Jones he considered the story to be a failure. So we're talking about all these different elements and where it's all over the place. And Dick himself thought it was a failure. This quote goes, The Jones book was a failure, let's face it. But the desire was not base or ignoble. I've always been interested in the Joyce technique of starting more than one thread and drawing these threads together, some nexus later in the book. However, in my Jones book, the threads don't come together specifically. There's no relationship between the mutant group who opened the book and the Jones political movement. Those two threads have no nexus. A is related to B, and B is related to C, and C to D, but A has no relationship to D. And it should have It should have had. I think if there had been a relationship between those two particular threads, the book would have come off better. Originally, the manuscript was longer. Ace agreed to publish it if I cut it. I cut the mutant thread entirely. Which would have left the book a more would have left a more unified book, but Ace demanded that I restore the thread. Without it in the book, the book was thin. This this showed me that I got off to the wrong direction in my novel, and the next books were based on a more unified approach. So hmm. he did try to cut the mutant thread. Yeah, I actually it actually read like it it had been trimmed down too much. Yeah, well that, the whole. Uh, Venusian thing or whatever it is, it it really read to me like we were missing something. Well, he wanted to cut it out entirely, but uh, it was also longer to begin with, right? So, well, you know, I the, the the thing about it is, is that I do he obviously saw this as an experiment and trying to to take all these di different threads, and you know, he he did this somewhat later, but never quite as as. Um, is, you know, like not having such a different approach between the different threads. This right. was, is, you know, it's clear that this was his attempt. This was his attempt to do that. And he never did that again, like to, to the same degree, at least as far as I can tell. So this was Dick's, uh, uh, pulp fiction attempt at weaving disparate yeah. narratives together. Actually, right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was, it didn't quite work so well but no it did not but i think i liked all three stories i like them and i think but I, I would have liked to, to hear all three stories told separately i agree i would agree with that and i think of the three 
the more interesting one is about the um the the lab the lab the Venus babies yeah the Venus babies <laughs> because you get kind of gypped. I don't well. I don't, Okay, maybe maybe you're maybe you're right. It would be the most interesting story, but to me, the I wanted to know more about their world. The mm-hmm. whole um, well, I, I think the idea of, of exploring characters who are living in this falsely created world is more interesting than. Yeah, I love the the post war mutant uh, rel. What is it? Relativism. Relativism. So yeah, let's talk about that for a world. second. What exactly did the relativism mean to you guys? I struggled with okay. truly understanding what to it me, meant. To me, what it meant was you were not allowed to judge anyone else's behavior. Okay, and everyone just does what they want it when is, they want, how they want, how they want. Then it what's the purpose illegal, of the FedGov? It, it was illegal to to even tell someone they were wrong. Right. It, well, and so FedGov is the government here at, at this time. And there's some really good world building that kind of sets this up on the fourth page. And so I, I want to read this part that just, just because I think it's really good world building from PKD. Um, I'll start snoring when it gets boring. <laughs> okay. Well, there. this is written from the perspective of the Venus babies looking out from the refuge. And it says, uh, outside lay San Francisco, the nocturnal city half asleep in its blanket of chill fog. Occasional cars crept here and there. Pockets of commuters emerged like complicated segmented worms from underground monorail terminals. Infrequent office light glowed sparsely. Lewis turned his back on the site. It hurt too much to see, to know that he was in here, trapped, caught within this closed circle of the group. So this is like kind of setting up um, the refuge and where they're at, but later, just a little bit down, it says, "Wartime sports generated by radiation pools, damage to the genes, an accident like Jones." They're talking about how there's this war, like whole wartime, like post-war, like sport world, and it sets up the circuses and the weird like kind of sexuality that you see in the in the circuses and all this and we only get it in one scene and it's a million times more interesting <laughs> right but what but even just from this view looking out from the refuge of, from the venus babies we see that and I, first of all i liked this passage because it was really well it was good prose it was good prose yes Fr- from 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 an early pkd uh, however and, i felt the scene that uh where they go to the uh, underground bar was a, a much better actual world building scene. Where they where they see the the um, the couple. Yes, I, I I have notes on that, so we'll 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 get there. Okay. But yeah, I, w- this this world and the relativism. So the idea is is supposed to be you know just set up this whole idea that I think you've got Philip K. Dick, who's a guy who's doing lots of drugs at this point. I mean. He probably was on serious meth while writing this book, right? Well, there or, was no meth, I don't think. Well, not meth, meth, but he was on methamphetamines. Or, or was he? Benzos. Benzos. Yeah, he was doing something big time. I, I have no idea. We, how has not one of us done the history of, uh, of, his, drug use? of his drug use? I think that is, honestly, I think that's an entirely different episode. I think we could <laughs> dedicate an entire episode to Dick's personal life, his interactions with his wives and the people with it, it, involved in his life. Why and, do I want Cody on that episode? Well, I want Cody on every episode, <laughs> right. but that's 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 a dream. Well, I think we'll. Uh, I think we'll, We just have to work it in as we go. Okay. Yeah, but but I would like to have an episode where we really do just kind of after we get to a certain point of reading everything, we should discuss Dick in how it relates to what we've read, and I think that would be an important episode to have. Yeah, a very special episode. Yeah, yeah. And, and Cody, come be on it, please. Well, and and look, I ain't begging. <laughs> I'll beg. So, so I think the idea with the relativism—you've got a guy who lives in liberal Berkeley, right, and he hangs out with. A lot of weirdos in, in that scene. <laughs> and yeah, I mean weirdos in, in a positive, in the most positive way. But um, well, it, was the, it was the center of the beatnik scene. So Yeah, so I think he wanted to put forward the idea of, of kind of more, more freedom and, you know, laissez-faire attitude towards morals and ethics and that kind of thing. And so I think this idea of that in, in the survival of the nuclear war, which happens in every 50s PKD book pretty much. 
Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's the 50s. Well, would you say that because, I mean, it's an easy way to get his precogs or his mutants in by saying we, the setting is a post-nuclear society and these are just the effects of the nuclear radiation. Right. And the whole circus that... Um, <sighs> <laughs> yeah, well, and you have, like, by the way, like, most of this uh, takes place in the year 2002, <laughs> which is funny. Right. Uh, nice. 2002 with the Venus Babies post-nuclear, yeah. But, hey, that's... that's is is Limp Biscuit around old. in this world? <laughs> <laughs> so, the next kind of, like, really good scene for world building or really excellent set up for me was the introduction of the circus. Basically, it's an interesting way that this Hitler surrogate and Floyd Jones kind of rises to power through precognition is that he operates out of a circus in that travels around in the post nuclear, you know, habitat. And there's a, I, there's a line on page 12. It says the war with its hard radiation and elaborate diseases had produced countless sports oddities, freaks, and here in one minor carnival, a vast variety had collected. And we're going to follow this government stooge around for 200 pages <laughs> instead. And directly above him sat a multi-man, a tangled mass of flesh and organs, heads, arms, wobbled uh, dully, and the creature was feeble-minded and helpless. Fortunately, his offspring would be normal, his multi-organs were not true mutants. Do you think if Terry Gilliam, Gilliam made the World the Jones Made movie that he talked about, it would have totally focused on this circus? Oh, 100%. <laughs> yeah. But but we'll get to that discussion when we're done talking about the book. But the circus, and like you said, it's the, really the most, it's totally bizarro. It's totally fucking weird. It's the most interesting thing in yeah, the book. Yeah, absolutely. I, I agree with that. but... It, accumulary. Well, Excuse I didn't me. think it was that interesting. Uh, Larry is the Minority <laughs> Report. <laughs> oh, zing! Uh, Tune in next week for more uh, Philip K. Dick puns. <laughs> so, um, so what do you... Th well, what do you think is the most interesting to you? What do you think is more interesting than the circus? Because I think the circus well, atmosphere I, is very interesting. You know, you guys are you guys are speaking of it, and, and, and I, you know, I kind of like you guys, but then, then again... <laughs> Uh, it he sounds kind like of likes us. It sounds like you're you're just opening up the ding dong and eating the uh, eating the cream <laughs> filling and then throwing the ding dong away. <laughs> How All so? you want is the cream filling? Oh, just because you know, it's the weirdest. Larry. That's the yeah, only that's reason the I put weird... those in my mouth. <laughs> <laughs> but it's the uh, there's cake. Around I thought it. The, the you know the the boring the boring agent was was very interesting. Okay. How so? Yeah. Oh, and so uh, I'll bite. his relationship with his wife and how they were dysfunctional within this uh, within this post-apocalyptic world, I, I found much more interesting than a bunch of freaks at a circus. And but, however, in this this introduction of the circus is where the relativism is introduced. So here we have this sure. line. We have this line. Um, this I don't know why I come to these things. The portly man indicated his wife and children. All of those stonely goblin. Uh, Stonely, gob gobbling up their popcorn and sugar candy. They like to come. The women, the kids go in for this stuff. And C uh, Cusick, Cusick. Cusick, Cusick says, under relativism, we have to let them live. Right? And, he sa and so, the sure, the portly man said, um, they got their rights just like everybody else, like you and me, mister. They got their lives, too. So, that's like just straight up a line that says what the theme of the relativism thing. Yeah, exactly. Is. Got it. <laughs> I'm just stupid. <laughs> you just missed it. Got hey, it. Yeah. Um, well, no, I mean, I didn't remember that line until I was just sitting here looking at the book. One more, so. I, I want to I kind of get back to what Larry was talking about, because I, I maybe it's, it's the amount of PKD I've read, or it's that I don't need to follow an, another kind of dummy around who works for the government. But I, I, I really found Cusick in Nina to be just kind of stand-ins for Dick in, in who, I don't know what wife of his. Wife epitome. number two. Yeah. It, I, it, it, I, I know inevitably they're just going to fly off on a spaceship to another colony. <laughs> well, right. But I was more interested in their relationship, not just with each other, but with the world around them when they go to the opera, when they go to the underground bar. 
how they they deal with their child. I did like the underground bar scene. Is the do, do we want to talk about the fact that a uh, uh, Kaminsky takes a seventeen year old girl to this bar? <laughs> it's a little weird. Am I right? Uh, yeah. There's 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 quite a bit of. I don't know. I don't know if it was weird point. for the time. What? Okay. You know, You're right. In post nuclear like, 2002, probably not as weird, I guess. Songs like uh, Sweet 16 or whatever, those kinds of things were mm-hmm. very popular back then. So. Yeah. So on page 32 of the vintage edition, there's definitely a lot more relativism talk. Um, I don't, I'm not going to read all of it. <laughs> but you, you get an understanding of Cusick is kind of standing in for PKD in, in a lot of this and asking a lot of questions. Which part is this? Uh, page 32 of the vintage edition so that he's having this discussion with his wife and he says to me the spectacle of the demigods sending millions of people to their deaths wrecking the world with holy wars and bloodshed tearing down whole nations to put over some religious and political truth is obscene filthy communism fascism zionism they're all opinions of absolutist individuals forced on whole continents and it has nothing to do with the sincerity of the leader or followers. The fact that they believe it makes it even more obscene. The fact that they kill each other and die voluntarily over meaningless verbalisms. You can see the, re- the reconstruction crews. You, you know we'll be lucky if we ever rebuild. So like he's basically blaming the end of the world on like all that shit. <laughs> and, on religion and and zealots and yeah, ba- 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 says, basically on religious extremism. Yeah, I suppose relativism is cynical. It surely isn't idealistic. It's the result of being killed and injured and made poor and working hard for empty words. It's the outgrowth of generations shouting slogans, marching with spades and guns, singing patriotic hymns, chanting and saluting flags. So yes, there is some. Hot takes. <laughs> yeah, right? There's, the, your, there's your hot take. Yeah. Get your oven mitts out. Uh, PKD's edition. Um, <laughs> but I find it I find it great that he he took this idea that I I think he totally believed in and then wrote a story defeating it. Right. Well Because no, I, I, I think he really did believe in in the relativism. Right. As a form of government. And I had written down, I just wrote the words drug freedom, <laughs> <laughs> like on the next page where uh, Cusick says, good God, then it's your business. You can bathe in it. You can freeze it or wear it. You're an adult. Right. Right. So, cause they're talking about, he finds cyanide in a, in a bottle and he's just like, fuck it. You know, you can do with it. What yeah. You, you can, if, it, you, if you want to live, you live. If you want to die, you die. If you want to. But, if you want to get high, you get high. If you don't... But let's think about this. This is the fucking year that Heartbreak Hotel was the number one hit. The Ten Commandments was the number one movie in theaters. This is some pretty political stuff for Ace Doubles to be putting out um, into the world. And so, and what was the uh, book that this was released with again? Uh, Man Ag- in Love with a Tiny Doll. <laughs> Agent of the Unknown. And it was about what again? A man in love with a tiny doll. Yeah, so there you go. Maybe they needed a little bit, a little, little, little more intellectual stuff. And well, remember, it's a man in love with a tiny doll stuff. um, But at this point, Elvis's hips were still illegal. So, (laughs) and you talk shit on on the uh, the doll book, but um, every review I read of it on Goodreads was five stars and considered a classic of science fiction. Excuse me, David. I did not talk shit about the doll book. I simply said that it might have provided a juxtaposition to Philip K. Dick's The World Jones Made. This is now how I will speak on the podcast <laughs> okay. in my NPR voice from now on. This isn't fucking NPR. I'm not saying that Full Moon doesn't have actionable uh, material with Doll Man. <laughs> uh, or or the follow-up Doll Man versus Demonic Toys. Thank you very much. Hey, yeah. all right. So, well, I mean, Margaret Sinclair has actionable. Maybe she can go after Full Moon for Doll Man. <laughs> Uh, it, anyways, I'm not going to talk about Dolman. <laughs> well, welcome back to the Full Moon Yeah, cast. this is not the Full Moon podcast. You would... I would do. totally have a Full Moon podcast. Is that, can we do that one next? Yeah, that's next. <laughs> After uh, Bergheads? After Bergheads. Um, in, the stro- in the Storm Air Report. The right. Storm Air Report, I would totally do. Okay, uh, the World Jones made. Do you have some notes that you want to... 
crack into I here? don't necessarily... Th- the, basically, my notes are just kind of cataloging the events that happen because my memory is shit, so I have to remember what happens. Um, but what did you guys... Th- I, well, I mean, we kind of already talked about it. My biggest issue with this book is that there's three different stories and none of them really seem to have anything to do with each other. Um, except for in the barest minimum it, yeah, way. Yeah, except for in a kind of... A, tangential way yes right and he admitted that was a problem yeah so um, um but I, I i don't so do you want to talk about let's let's talk a little bit about this whole um uh let's talk about how the the precogs of of jones works um in chapter five there's the precogs of jones or the precognition of jones the precognition of jones how okay. is precognition we talked about it a little bit earlier it takes he can see a year, so they actually explain this to him. To me, the, the fu- what he sees in the future, this is the past. Right now, uh, with you there, here in the building, this is a year ago. It's not so much like I see the future. It's more like I have one foot stuck in the past. I can't shake it loose. I'm retarded. <laughs> I'm retarded. Um, <laughs> David, David. I'm sorry. I, I didn't. David had a moment. I had a moment. That's okay. I, I'm I, laughing at the that's fact that okay. he used that word. I said gypped earlier, and I felt bad since I said it. So okay, I um, I'm reliving one year of my life forever. So and then he talks about like how if he's watching a movie, he's he's always seeing it. I, that is kind of wackadoo precog science. Um, because if you try to really think it through, it's really hard to think about. How it that it works. is very hard to think through, but it, from his perspective. He's looking at the life we're all leading as a shadow of a life he's already led. Yeah. That, so is that, it, I, his, I liked that concept a lot. His precognition is what he considers to be now. Right. Like what he sees in the future. Right. The first time he sees it is the real time. Right up until when when, when he dies. When he knows that he's going to die in a year. Yeah. Right. right. So that is kind of a neat concept. Yeah. Um, I would have liked to have had more time with Jones to explore him as I don't, a character. I don't necessarily think we needed more time with Jones. Why? I I feel like I understand so, Jones. So I can spend more time listening to Cusick and his wife argue or, and not care about their kid and then argue about maybe there'll be a better life somewhere else. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> So he does. I mean, it was central to the story. Boring. How is that boring? It's in all these fucking books. Oh my god, you and your fucking explosion generation. <laughs> That's right, Larry. I need every god movie to be like the last action hero. I'm not where I am not defending <laughs> the millennial standpoint right now. No, I, I I know we disagree on that, but I I like the uh, I I think for me personally, I I had enough of Jones. I didn't find Jones too interesting outside of his power and outside of him being locked into that power. I didn't, there wasn't much else to tell as far as I was concerned. I think there was a lot to tell because, I mean, if, if you got more into the, into how his movement grew, because we, see, I, we have a huge time jump where we go from him being in the circus and 20 years later, he's boom. Yeah, there, there, there's a lot of, and then there's a lot of time jumps, and then Jones was this, and he's grown into this, and he's grown into that. But it doesn't, you know what? leader now. Really, but, the reality from, from is. From a storytelling is, standpoint, if you're going to follow Jones, it's just going to be Jones saying, and then I knew this was going to happen. And then I knew this was going to happen. But you don't so, have to focus on all the precognitions. You can focus on how it affects him as a human being. Mm-hmm. At least in Which my opinion. Didn't... But you guys, listen. I want to argue for the arguably the more interesting character, and that is the radioactive hitman. <laughs> because that is the character I wanted to was spend more time radioactive? with. radioactive? No! <laughs> He's not radioactive. He's he not just... unstable. He's just a dude. And he had a headache. He did have a was... headache. Because it was hot. <laughs> uh, so I uh, guess that makes him a little radioactive. Ooh, that synopsis promised me so much. <laughs> um, I'm try I, I, to... I would have liked to know more about the league. You're right. Yeah, I, in that sense, I think you're right. What about the like Jones the, uh, boys? Re, yeah, the guy that uh, did the burning of the. Uh, oh, that of the, the guy who burned the, the drifter, drifter on the roof. Yeah. Where'd yeah. that guy go? Um. Yeah, I don't know. Well, there's a lot of daring stuff, like and and world, like when we with the world building earlier that there's a lot of daring stuff for 1955 when you actually wrote it right i know it came out in 56 so i think the bar scene that you guys were talking about that's page 82 
of the vintage edition. That is even weirder than uh, than the circus because you have the uh, two figures on stage, professionally agile and supple bodied, had begun making love. The action was carried out as a ritual. It had been done so many times that it was a series of dance motions without passion or intensity. Presently, as a kind of mounting tempo, the sex of the man began to change. After time, it was a rhythmic motions of two women. And then, towards the conclusion, the figure had originally presented itself as a woman, transformed itself into a man, and the dance ended as it had begun with a man and woman quietly making love. Um, I thought that was I thought that was beautiful. Yeah, yeah, was, I like that scene. Yeah, and then there's a, and I love the fact that one of them's on heroin, one of them's smoking a joint, one of you know the our our heroes are just sitting in the corner watching the show getting fucked up. Right, and which is pretty fucking daring for 1955. Yeah, 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 uh, especially in science fiction. So, um, I, then, isn't there... I wonder how that made Arthur C. Clarke feel when he read it. <laughs> was he like, "Whoa"? He was probably isn't just being a actually, crappy, uptight yeah. old man. Well, he may have really liked it. I don't know. Okay, uh, isn't there a contradiction here though with the? Uh, I'm sorry, what's the wife's name again? Nina. 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 Isn't there a contradiction with Nina being part of this religious movement, but also reveling in all the uh, all all the stuff she can do under the the current government? Um, talk amongst yourselves. There's a page ninety three where Nina and Jack or and Cusick talk about it. I'll look at this. Cusick. A bit. Cusick. Um, what do you think, Anthony? Well, what I, what exactly do you mean? I'm not sure I follow. Okay, so there's. T- the goal of of Jones' uh, right movement is to overthrow the government, mm-hmm. right, and install this new government that's based on war and what? Do they still have the the do anything you want to do relativity or whatever? Well, it no, is? I think they're trying to get rid of relative relativity. There wasn't anything about relativism. That, yeah, there was. It was. See that if they're not installing that again, it's an incomplete analogy. If they're not installing a new kind of government. Other than we're going to go to war with these aliens. Mm-hmm. So her going to the Jones side confuses me because she still seems to want to have one foot in the relativity. <laughs> I keep well, well, I don't think I think Relativist, that I think that's her character. I think she feels that Jones's mission is is but valid, to... but I don't think she I think she struggles with the fact that she knows that if she chooses the Jones side. One hundred percent. She gives up the life that she she knows. She gives up her relationship with her husband. She gives up their child, that which they both put up to. It, the it ends up in some type of care facility, right? Yeah. yeah. I mean, even though they pretty much leave it with a robot nanny twenty four seven anyway. <laughs> right. You know, I, I think that her struggle is the fact that she is. You know, she want she believes in what Jones is doing, but it it comes at the cost of sacrificing her stability and her life. But she want, she craves excitement, and to her, the Jones movement is excitement. Whereas, well, that's a character what we, trait. What we regard as excitement mm-hmm. would be all the things that we're not allowed to do, right? Yeah, and she's so, and she and, and she's and allowed she's, to do all the things that we're not allowed to do. Well, I don't think she is. A, she allowed to join up with Jones. No, no, no. In, like in as part of her life in this society, she can do all the drugs, all the sex. All, all the that, sex. All the sex. <laughs> <laughs> New podcast. She she does go back to have sex with the uh, hermaphroditic character. So, yeah, there's a mm-hmm. scene. Uh, um, that's what happens in page ninety three. There's a whole like. Um, Do you want to read that? Right. Well, uh, I I think that that's part of her character, and that's the part of the conflict between her and Cusick is that he's a big believer in following the rules, and he doesn't need to kind of have action in his life because he says it at some at one point in the book he says i have my work right i mean kuzik seems like a real boring dude. okay he know. does seem like a real boring dude hey he's a cop what do you expect not all cops are that boring so yeah uh, dirty no harry is pretty Kusik interesting tries no to comment. get her to come home with him and she's like i'm staying here with a hermaphrodite which by the way the, the use of the term hermaphrodite is really get gets really kind of eh, um it kind of makes me feel icky, like towards at this point in the book. Um, Why is that? Just because, I, you know, I don't think it's. Um, 
Whoa. <laughs> oh, no. Uh, that, was a, that was a coded message. Um, I, well, I mean, obviously, it was 62 years ago, so I just, I, it just made me uncomfortable. Well, th- those two characters were... So you give me shit for saying something true. about what he refers to other people as on the ep- first episode, but it's fine when David brings it up. No, I'm not. I'm, I'm, it is what it is, but I, I'm just saying it just made me a little uncomfortable uh, at this point. All right. And and um, but uh, yeah. So uh, the herm- the hermaphrodite turned slightly and said to Cusick, "Mind your own business, chum. In this world, everybody does what he wants." Cusick reached out, grabbed a hold of the creature's shirt, calls it calls the hermaphrodite a creature, and lifted him from his feet. Uh, the hermaphrodite was amazingly light. He struggled. He twisted. And then it says, Nina turned and started off down the corridor. Her methodite noticing, quickly hurried after her, an eager expression on her face. So there's a whole thing, like, she was wanting to be there with, with the hermaphrodite at that point. Right. So, I guess it's kind of this, like, beat them, if you can't beat them, join them kind of thing. That he was trying to have Nina as a character, like, she, she just kind of falls into. Um, but then Joan, doesn't Jones go against all those things? Uh no his his your what you're thinking of is his his anger and hatred towards the drifters or his no I'm not thinking of that that's the it's, uh, it's not towards the hermaphrodites because he's been he was a part of their they were a part of the circus that he was traveling in so uh, I, if nothing else then that is an unclear part of the book yes mm-hmm. I, that's one of many <laughs> many of things many. unclear but it, it would be the part that bothered me the most about the book is well, the uh, is the lack of definition of what that movement was other than trying to unite people under war against a an alien enemy. Right. Well, okay, so... Because uh, he got rid of the prisons, he got rid of the secret police, he got rid of all the police, actually. Right. And But other than that, we don't know anything... All right, you guys were right. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that changed real quick. Should have been more about uh, at least the movement. Not Jones himself, but the movement. <laughs> Larry talked himself into agreeing with us. Yeah, well, I talked myself into liking this book more after, like, kind of talking about it. But, <laughs> okay, so you brought up the whole Drifters thing a little bit there and how, and and so one of the next things that I kind of, I have dog-eared is, is the problematic introduction of the Drifters as Jews. Cusick says, you really hate them. Uh, you don't know anything about them, do you? They're there, Jones said bitterly. They're all around us, encircling us, closing in. Can't you see their plans coming across space century after century, working out their schemes, landing first on Pluto, on Mercury. Pluto, then Mercury? That's weird. Uh, Okay, coming closer all the time, nearer to the prize, setting up bases for attack. So this is kind of playing on the same fear that Hitler did with um like the Jews are trying right, to the control. Jews are trying to get you. They're trying to control everything. Yep. And so this kind of continues with and then it was on the very next page, it was page forty four of the vintage edition, where he, Pearson literally says, Do you think Hitler was a precog? Right. <laughs> I mean word <laughs> for word. It's like said it, there's no ambiguity there, you know on the nose, PKD. Right. But then you get a little bit more of the problematic stuff with with the Drifters, where he kind of explains, he gives, does some world building on what the Drifters were. A uh, gigantic single-celled organism using empty space as a culture medium. It drifts using some kind of vague propulsion mechanism. It's absolutely harmless. It's an amoeba. It's 20 feet wide. It's got some kind of tough rind to keep out the cold. There's no... This is no sinister invasion. These poor goddamn things just wander around mindlessly. This is somebody, like, arguing with Jones. Yes. But Jones obviously tries to... Isn't that uh, Kaminsky that's arguing with him? Um, it is... Yes. I believe so. So, yeah, I mean, the whole problematic thing, and, and I, it, like, PKD was excited that that Damon Knight pointed out in his review of the book that the drifters were an analogy for Jews, but it's pretty freaking obvious, you know? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Considering that it says, is Hitler a precog on the page before? He's not exactly bearing this concept. Right, but he doesn't really fulfill it either. So... Yeah, yeah. Nina, well, yeah, so... Yeah, it, it the the whole it's a, it's a little weak on both sides of it. 
You know, yeah. it's a little weak on the analogy side, and it's a little weak on the uh, on the non analogy side. Do you think it's weak? I think it's side. really on the nose there. I mean, he like straight up says. He invokes Hitler on the page before, so I don't think it's weak. I right, think it's on the, the nose. But then he, but then you know, clearly Jones is not Hitler. Well, and clearly these aliens are not Jews. Well, uh, but I think that's that was the attempt, or I think that's what PKD. But was the going analogy for. is very surface. That's what I'm saying. Okay, it's a very surface analogy, like you say, on the nose and surface analogy. It has no depth to it. Right. It can't be carried out throughout the whole story because it has no depth to it. Yeah, so but at least he's he's doing some something pretty interesting here. <laughs> so Kamitsky's role in, in this, what did you think of Kamitsky as a character? Do you have any thoughts or feelings on this guy cuz my next notes are on he's, him. I I thought he was pretty interesting for a um a cop that sort of is working outside his own system. Right. Well, and he cared. He cared a lot about the Ven- Venetian babies. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Venusian. Venusian, not babies. Venetian babies. <laughs> the the Venus babies. The Venus babies. So, Cusick says to Kaminsky at one point that puts the drifters in the position of, and Kaminsky says, "Hordes from hell, Satan's legions, the evil ones." So. <laughs> You know, Comiskey is kind of furthering that idea of, of the Drifters as evil. Well, yeah, he he fully goes over to uh, Joan's side at, yeah. before they catch him. Yep, yep. All right, so I'm going to try to... I'm just going to thumb through to make sure that I haven't missed anything that I thought. There's some really weird stuff with Nina and Cusick talking about political stuff later and where they get into China. Do you remember that part? Yeah, when they... W- when the uh, when what's her face is talking about it, uh, Nina, yeah. No, so, no, the is that the that's not the friend care or the seventeen year old, right? I believe her name is Tyler. Tyler, maybe is it, it Tyler or Taylor? Uh, it might be Taylor. I should really write down the cast of characters or something. Yeah, no, it's Nina, and I thought that's the wife. Uh, well, Nina is the wife. Yeah, Nina is the wife. Oh, so you're you're talking about right after? Yeah. So the, okay. So there's like this. We find out that Nina was grew up in China. <laughs> uh, that she's English. Yeah, it says right here. Wait, I no, thought, no, no, that's Tyler. That's Tyler. That's Kaminsky's seventeen-year-old date. Oh, okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. But she's from English parents that were missionaries. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and this the seventeen-year-old. She has all these political views. So he's trying to put forward this idea that she's like this young idealist. Right? And then she says, My father was a devout party worker. He fought with all of his heart and soul against the the Mohammedans, which is the Muslims, and the Christian fanatics. He brought me up. My mother was killed by bacterial toxins. And since she wasn't official, she wasn't entitled to shelter. I lived with my father in the party offices a mile or so underground, surviving the war. Uh, We were there until the war ended. That is, I was there. My father was shot by the party near the end of the war. Shot for what? They ask. Devotionism. The Hoff book was being circulated in our area, too. My father and I set up uh, portions by hand. We circulated them among party workers. So it, so now they're talking about how relativism kind of works in a Chinese perspective. Right. Which is really, like, kind of weird, kind of... Well, how it overcame communism and became... You know, it overcame all of our governments and it, became the root of all the world government. Right. And I think this scene is specifically a reaction to the reaction of Solar Lottery from the editors who kept saying it was a very left wing book, that they thought it was a pro communist book. And I think that like this particular scene with the with the young woman, the Comiskey's date, Tyler. Right. Yeah, I think this was specifically a reaction to um to solar lottery. So, um, well, where does relativism fall on the, uh, on the political scale? Well, I don't think there really is a relativism movement. Right. Well, I think it's I mean, just an idea if, if that there was, in, there is in the, in the book. So if there, if it existed, Oh, you mean how it existed? Okay. Yeah. Well, like coming out on page one Oh three, there's like that where, where the people are protesting against the relativism and they say, and the tyrannical reign of, uh, alien relativism, free men's minds, 
uh, disband the terrorist thought control, secret police, end concentration slave labor camps, restore freedom and liberty. <laughs> and then, uh, uh, really getting to PKD themes here, the last sign uh, says, onto the stars. Yeah, right. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> So I think the Tyler character, like, I really do believe, like, she's brought in as to be this kind of young idealist kind of thing. She is but she's a, on the party side. Yes. You know, she's, well, she's totally counter to Nina. Right. You know, it, Nina has, is confused and has these beliefs that follow Jones. Mm-hmm. Whereas Tyler is on the exact opposite side and is purely for the relativism right party. She's the young idealist right and so there's a lot of i actually like the interactions between nina and tyler it's surprising to have yeah two women in an early pkd book with such agency right um like and and really like uh, putting forward the political ideas um, yeah the way anthony has been dogging him so much about his women characters you, well, I figured, you I can you can, would, you can say what you want. I, I figured they would both be like trash, and but they turned out to be very good, uh, fun characters, characters to to pay attention to. He still just. I had, mean, he still does it in later books. Yeah, and he still has characters that are just called the girl, like you know, the Negro. Yeah, <laughs> it comes up later. Yep. Just wait until we get to Eye in the Sky, Larry, because we're going to have some hot takes, my friend, you and me. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so uh, uh, on 104, there is when um, it was FedGov on Earth, relativism was was stifling them. Beyond Earth, it was drifters. Once FedGov was gone, once the drifters had been destroyed, it was the old story, green pastures beyond the next hill. So, like, this is kind of where everything starts shifting in the book. You see, like, the, that they're trying to call for Jones to become leader. So, you know, I, I think there there's interesting things here. Like, this isn't a great book. <laughs> it isn't awesome. But, you know, we, we have some really interesting, you know, ideas throughout. Yeah. So um, that's the, the end of the specific parts that I wanted to call attention to. Okay. Um, so we can get into... I mean, the- as far as the action is concerned, there was the scene with the assassin. There was the scene with the uh, the spaceship crashing, and then there was the the actual assassination. That was it. Uh, yeah, but there's I think the most interesting and exciting parts of the book have to do with some of the weird stuff, the bar, the circus, those right. kinds of things. There's a lot of really cool weird scenes, but at the end, I felt that they didn't collectively add up to anything. So it's like Tarantino. Yeah. Oh, come on. <laughs> so who would you Ving like Rames Tarantino. who would I do, but who would Ving Rames play in the <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, I love Tarantino, but then I'm going to bag on him. Yeah, cuz he sucks as a person. So what's your I mean I mean in the end, okay, let's get into overall thoughts. Yeah, sure. I gave this book 3 stars on Goodreads as soon as I finished reading it. It feels like after an hour of discussing the book it feels a little better than than three stars to me in the sense that we've got a lot of good discussion out of it. But, sure. but I'm going to hold to my original thought of like that's what I originally thought about it without having read bonus materials. And you guys know I can be convinced by listening to like yes director's commentary tracks. And <laughs> like if I hear what somebody was meaning to do, a lot of times it'll convince me that it was better than it was. But I, I think World Jones Made is not a terrible book. You know, three Venusian babies in a refuge out of five <laughs> yeah. um, for me. But I, overall, I'm glad I read it. I'm glad I had the experience that I've added to my PKD knowledge. Nice. Uh, Anthony, why don't you go next? Uh, I'm going to give it two Venusian uh, babies mutant babies out of five. <laughs> and... Uh, Mostly because I was, I'm, I'm gonna take this to my grave. I was lied to by this synopsis, <laughs> um, and I think that while on their own, a lot of these scenes are really cool. The scene in the underground bar, the the sex scene that happens in there, the carnival scene with Jones, the assassination attempt. I, I just don't feel like it didn't all come together for me. And even though I know that wasn't Dick's intention. 
Mm-hmm. I, I think it does, was his um, intention. Well, sorry. Even though it failed... Yeah, he knew that it failed. That's right. What you're saying. Yeah. So even though he knew that it failed, that doesn't make me like it any more or less. It just didn't work for me as a whole. So yeah, two Venusian babies out of five. How many Venusian babies for you, Larry? Two, two yeah. Venus babies, and uh, maybe one of those uh, mechanical snakes. <laughs> one Hitler esque uh, precog. <laughs> the uh, I, I really liked the the world that it's set in. And I liked a lot of the characters. I like Jones. Mm-hmm. I just, it wasn't complete. And mm-hmm. for me, it's got to be complete if it's going to be considered at least average. Yeah. Yeah. So. Now, keep in mind, everybody, we, we're, we're all um, glad we read it just because we had this experience being able to. No, I, just because I didn't like me. something didn't mean I, I'm not taking something away from this experience. No, I, we're not quitting. Yeah, no. we're not, qui- yeah, <laughs> we're yeah, not this, quitting. Yeah, the, the book, book two, that's the book that broke the podcast. <laughs> no, I wasn't saying that. I just mean that, like, I think that there are things to get out of and learn from from reading even the the less desirable PKD books. Yeah, well, the whole reason we're doing this is because we want to learn more. We want to learn. That's, that's the thing is this is an early book and we're uh, we're finding things out about him and he's finding out things about him yeah. as he writes more books. So as we do with all of his books, since we've done one before. Oh snap! How would we fix the world Jones made? In a film adaptation, either directed, written and directed by us, or who would we hire to do? Let, let's let's put it this way: We're writing the script and we're hiring a director. How do we make the world Jones made as a film? If somebody was throwing money at us, who wants to start? Larry, I'll, I'll start. Okay, I. We should we should point out first that Terry Gilliam had uh, owned the rights. And in 2009, he was circling making the world Jones made. Oh, no way. I did not know that. Yes, Terry Gilliam was. uh, Terry Gilliam is not having a good week PR-wise in the world right now. I don't think Uh, he's been having a good few months. Yeah, with Me Too, like some statements he made about Me Too movement that didn't play well. He just learned to shut his mouth. Yeah, anyways, uh, uh, Terry Gilliam almost made a movie of the world Jones made in 2009. He tried. There was a script written, apparently. Interesting. All right, Larry, the floor is yours. I would personally make this much more a film noir rather than the usual PKD action movie. Mm-hmm. Uh, I would definitely follow the police officer. What's his name? Cusick. Cusick. So would you focus and on... And Jones would not, would would be in the distance most of the time. Interesting. And you would focus on, you would have, would you have I the... I probably re- wouldn't even have the V... You wouldn't have the, the Venus, Venus babies. The Venus babies at all? No. Hmm. Um, you might want. I might want to use the Venus babies like a spice, <laughs> like a little like uh, kind of seasoning, uh, but not really focus on them. I would focus on Jones and the relativism and the, the mutants and the yeah the post nuclear thing. And I think I would definitely, um, if I was working on the script, I would focus on starting off with the circus and Jones's story and i would probably deal with a little bit of that 20 years that we skip in the yeah. novel yeah definitely yeah um or and you could reverse engineer it Cusick being the main character um and kind of investigating why yeah i agree with you larry Let, let's let's focus on Cusick wanting to like find out um sort of how it how it works yeah, and let's do it with a trippy method. Let's do a trippy method. Let's have um, Kusek travel through visions and in back into the past by um, by kind of hacking into Jones's precognitive precognitive um, like kind of slipstream. That's how right. I do it. Like I I, I I would do it that way personally. Terry Gilliam would be cool because he would do the circus really well. Right for for um for making this film with like kind of a Brazil style like like visual motif, but you know who could do the same thing and I think make a better movie is Jean Pierre Genet, who made Amelie yeah. and Delicatessen and City of Lost Children, and so I would actually rather have Genet do um I would love to see Genet do a, a PKD um story even even in French. 
Um, I'd be down for that. Even in French. Even in French, I think that would be really cool. Um, what about uh, Gaspar Noé? N- who? N- no. No? Who? <laughs> who? I don't even know who that is. I would like to see a Gaspar Noé PKD adaptation. Just not this one. But I don't think this one is the right one. <laughs> uh, Gaspar Noé out. did um, Irreversible, Enter Ooh. the Void. <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah, see that. Jones have you seen Have you seen Enter the Void? Yeah, it's a good movie. Not, not you, David. No. Okay. I've seen Irreversible, but um... <laughs> yeah, Gaspar <laughs> Noe is the world Jones made. <laughs> that would be very interesting looking. What? Ew. what the... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or um, or Werner Herzog's. The world you guys, Jones you made. guys, Come stop, on. David. You David. guys, you really need to see Enter the Void before you, no, you say okay. it. Larry, shut up, <laughs> you guys. Okay. Lars von Trier's The World Joe's Made. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, David, go on. Michael Bay's The World. Better than say. Lars von Trier's yeah. The World Joe's Made. Uh, no. Anything's better than that. Seriously, on a serious note, uh, Janae is the one who I would hire. But um, I think that doing the slipstream with Cusick, like traveling in and out of into the visions of Jones is how I would adapt it. So you could kind of go back and forth in time in the story and do right. kind of like a weird um, thing and then do um, have Nina and Tyler and Kamiski all be characters who like start worrying for Cusick for when he was just losing his mind being inside the Jones visions. And the reason why I would do it that way is because then you could have the tension and have that kind of paranoia, lose your mind kind of thing that we've mm-hmm. kind of grown accustomed to in PKD films, yeah. and then it adds tension that it just does not exist in the book. That's why I would do it that way. I agree with that. I agree. Uh, Anthony, do you have any more thoughts on that? <sighs> on what you said, or is it my turn? It's your turn. So, oh, I'm of two minds about this. Is, if one, I were... is one a year in the future? Yes. Um. So if I were to write this, I would focus almost solely on Jones and kind of make Cusick a tertiary character, like on the out, like investigating, but not the main focus, because I think Jones for me is the most interesting person in the story. <laughs> and I would have, uh, I think my director for it would be Hodorowsky. Really? Ooh, Hodorowsky. You can get but, anybody you want but, for it. But if I couldn't do that, and we wanted to equally focus on Jones and Cusick in kind of the, the investigation into this weird precognitive world with the circus and everything else, I think I think Lynch would be perfect for it. Because he's proven with Twin Peaks he can do kind of the government investigative type of characters experiencing the weirder shit. Mm-hmm. So those are those would be it'd either be Hodorowsky or David Lynch. You know I love mm-hmm. David Lynch, but um, he hasn't done a really good job of adapting. In the past, yeah, that's not really his forte. That's not his hey, forte. <laughs> this is my dream directors, okay? Okay, get off it. Um, yeah, uh, Lynch would make an interesting PKD movie. I don't know how. Yeah, that would be really interesting. I would like to see him do it. But I, but if I but of the two, Hodorowski top pick. And how weird is it that he made a Dune movie? <laughs> it's really weird. <laughs> um, uh, I'm glad he's not making the new one. Uh, Denis Venu is, is really pretty, pretty exciting. Cool. Yeah, he's working on uh, Dune, and I think he's going to be amazing for it. However, he did make a lawnmower driving across the country movie, right? Not David Denis Venu. David Lynch did. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I want to see <laughs> Denis Venu. Oh. Denis Venu's lawnmower man. <laughs> I'd watch that. Uh, Yes, David Lynch made the Straight Story was about a guy. Straight Story, yeah. Yeah, it was a very straightforward movie about a guy. Have you seen Straight Story? I have not. It's interesting. It's um, what I think is cool about the Straight Story is it's David Lynch making a very not David Lynch movie. I'll have so, to check it out. Yeah, um, it is definitely a, a weird one. Um, okay, so that's the world Jones made. I think um, you know we've done our. I think we nailed it, guys. I think we really nailed this one. <laughs> well, I feel good about it. I, you know, we don't get any feedback from the people out there. Well, we um, should we should really announce our our stuff on this. We also don't do a whole lot of social media, to be quite honest. Yeah, We're, we, we we fail pretty hard at that. <laughs> it what really is, is. It's two curmudgeons and David. So, well, it's true. I'm the happy guy. 
That's yeah, you're, you're the happy yeah, guy you're in this the happy trio. One. <laughs> That's really fucking scary. Um, so yeah, you're the people person here. If you made it this far and you're on the treadmill or walking around or doing dishes or whatever, and you've listened to us this far, please, uh, you know, drop us a line. Let us know what you think. We are working on trying to get on more formats. Your Stitchers, your um, your Googles, your um, your Apples. We're we're working on it. Please bear with us. Uh, we're trying to make the best content we can. We uh, really appreciate the people that are taking the time, listening, sharing. Please do so at Dickheads Pod on Twitter, Dickheads Podcast on Instagram, and all that fun stuff, and on Facebook. Please uh, help us out. So next time. What book are we reading, Anthony? The Man Who Japed. Can you give us a short preview? A short preview of The Man Who Japed. Following a devastating nuclear war, the moral reclamation (laughs) government took over the world and forced its citizens to live by strictly puritanical rules. No premarital sex drunkenness or displaying of neon signs, all of which are reinforced through a constant barrage of public messages. The chief purveyor of these messages is Alan Purcell, next in line to become head of the Propaganda Bureau. But there's just one problem. A statue of the government's founder has been vandalized and the head is hidden in Purcell's closet. In this buttoned-up society, maybe all a revolution needs is one really great prank. So we went from relativism right to this? Yep. So, so I guess this is PKD's foray into comedy? Yeah, slapstick, <laughs> hopefully. <laughs> all right, uh, next time on Dickheads, we'll see you then. Good you night, wanna, everybody. You don't want to mention our movie one? Oh, yeah, that's right. We are going to do a movie one next. So the next movie is going to be what, David? Total Recall. The and we're still working on Colin getting Colin Farrell, guest. Total Recall. No, I quit. Uh, okay, no. The Arnold Schwarzenegger, Total Recall. We're working on a special guest. We should do... I prefer do, to think of it as the Ronnie Cox, Total Recall. But that's we should thing. do both, just because I think it would be an interesting discussion. But right now, we're just doing the original Total Recall. We'll watch the original Total Recall together. We can watch the other one on our own if we want to. How about that? I don't know. We'll do a separate episode on that eventually. Yeah, I think we should. I think it's interesting. All right. <laughs> you made us watch Minority Report. Yeah. All right. What are we going to do after Total Recall? Do we know? Uh, probably what? Adjustment Bureau. Or, Maybe. or no, we're Screamers. Doing... Oh, yeah, screamers. let's do Screamers. Screamers. All right. So All right. remember, people, to, to keep your brains paranoid. Stay paranoid. <laughs> keep it paranoid. Stay paranoid. Oh, my God. Yeah.